Hello and welcome to Antiques Masterclass. Today, Lennox Cato's finally, uh, very kindly come in today to, um, to speak about veneers from the 16th century through to present time. Um, Lennox, thank you so much for coming in today. And um, I'm really fascinated to hear a little bit more about um, veneers from the 16th century. Right, um, yes, there's a, there's a lot to know. And um, you've got to begin at the very beginning. So it really started in the early 1600s. Um, what I've got here, I've got um, three examples of Chester drawers, and um, they're made of oak, and they're just ordinary domestic pieces of furniture. And the idea people veneered pieces was to make an ordinary piece more important. These pieces were uh, veneered in cedarwood, um, or... Is it like Jacobean? Well, there's Jacobean periods, yes. They'd be talking around 1620, 1650. And um, so they, they had a contrast in wood, which I say, which is either cedar or another wood which is snake wood, and um, which has a slight pattern to it. Uh, sometimes they used to uh, imitate tortoiseshell. So they're making a domestic English piece of furniture into something more more elaborate. Is it more to show off to their friends when they come over or is it just for their own personal? It was their own, for their own personal thing because when we look back they in the early um, 1600s, 1700s, 18th century they spent a lot of time in their own house and so they wanted to make the things around them look, look beautiful. So this is the beginning. Now when we look at when veneer, veneering first started it started really, as I said, implying on the domestic pieces. This is known as a coffer. And uh, with a coffer, um, it was all finely carved. And then they introduced little pieces of wood. Um, and this is known as chipping. So it was trying to, again, make an ordinary piece just a little bit better than what somebody else had. So we've got two examples here. Um, so this one is nicely carved along the frieze, and then where you have the three panels, and then around the edge, it's most probably um, a bog oak, which is black, and then a fruit wood, which is yellow. So you brought so it's a nice contrast. And again, on this other piece down there, you can see um, another in, uh, the decoration where they, again they've used either bog oak, which so which is jet black mm. against the honey colour of the oak. To give them sort of two tones. To give that. a contrast, and, yes. Um, well, if they bought, let's just say they bought this coffer, mm -hmm. w would it be made veneered, they, they would buy it as veneered, or would it be done at a later they, date? No, they would have, this would have been, um, let's say, bespoke. Okay. Because they, 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 when you see coffers, they're, they're regional, they vary in size, they vary, um, some, some of them have carving on the, on the panels, and um, you can look at a coffer and more or less work out what part of the country it's from. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Now, when we look at um, uh, the basic work, it was originally parquetry. Um, what I've got here is just an example of what parquetry is. So it's going to be you've got quite a basic thing to begin with, and it gets more complicated. And parquetry is laying down either little squares or rectangular pieces of wood at, at, at various angles. And here there's a 19th century box, and if you look in the, the centre, this panel here, it's the same piece of wood laid down at an angle, and it creates a cube effect, and you can create different patterns. It's beautiful. This is what we all see all the time. You walk into a house or into... Uh, a, a living space, and you'll see a basic parquetry floor. It's a rectangular piece of wood laid in in particular fashion. The Continentals were more exotic with our um, parquetry work. Uh, this example is, again, rectangular pieces of wood. Someone's been a bit more creative and then framing the, the pieces as, as a whole. And then we, this is today's example of being ultra trendy. It's the same principle. It's very, very basic, just pieces of wood laid at an angle, and it hasn't really gone out of fashion. It's, it's what they've done here, the basic thing, but made it into the 21st century. 
Now, the most ex expensive form of veneering was marquetry. Um, this was introduced by the uh, Dutch in around 1625, and then gradually it spread through Europe and came over here. <coughs> um, marquetry was very, very, it, it's time consuming. Yeah, yeah, you can, yeah. and, um, and the detail in it is, is, is wonderful. You're using many types of different wood here for this, I think. Yes, yeah, what they've used here, uh, when we look at this mirror, this is known as a, as a, um, a cushion framed mirror. And when we see these mirrors, uh, normally uh, we see them without the tops because to, to have the top is, is, uh, is quite unique. Um, so most of the ones which you'll see on the market, the tops are missing. And um, you'll find that the marquetry work is either the groundwork can be ebony, and then you'll see all these lovely colours of sycamore, um, walnut, uh, little veneers lay, laid onto the groundwork. The veneer would be hand cut and it would be about two centimetres thick, which is quite thick if you imagine, because this is actually curved, and to actually get that curvature, they had to either soak the piece of wood, then lay it down on the, on the, on the um, shape as it is, but say being slightly curved. Um, the best ones, which this is a, a fine example, not only is it inlaid with all these various woods, but it's also inlaid with ivory. So this was really, really exotic. And over the years, unfortunately, this has faded. But if you look very carefully, you can see some reds. And, um, and in, in places, you can see some greens. Um, the, the red is uh, from the sycamore tree. And, and, and again with the green. And uh, the sycamore is a great wood for actually holding dye. And uh, as we go through the uh, slideshow, you'll see some more pieces of sycamore. So the white bits would be the ivory there? That's right, that, yes, it's the, yes, this is the white bits are ivory. Some of the ivory actually is stained. Um, but that is such a good example of fine marquetry work. So now we're talking around um, 1700s. Uh, these were made for rich people and so this was the peacock syndrome of actually sh showing off their, uh, their wares. <coughs> this, Excuse me. this is a, not a particularly good picture, it's slightly pixelated um, but it gives you an idea of other things they were making in marquetry Stunning. and uh, what this is, is an enclosed cabinet, and um, one door has been opened. You can see this uh, concentric circle, um, all with different uh, woods. When it's closed, again, we have this wonderful panel of marquetry work there. And along the frieze drawer, these circles, these are known as oyster veneers. And oysters, um, you think, well, how do you get an oyster? <laughs> on a piece of furniture. Mm. Now, what an oyster is, is if you imagine a, 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 the, um, let's say a bough of a tree, and if you cut it at a 45 degree angle, you get a nice oval shaped slither. And the heart looks, literally looks like an oyster in a shell. Now, again, that's laid down, that has to be laid down with little pins, bearing in mind it's, it's almost two centimetres thick, because when they're cutting these um, veneers, they're cutting them by hand. And so in places it will be thick and in places it will be thin, because it, it literally can be all over the place. And it has to, each one has to look almost identical to make it... Absolutely, yes. And I say, this was so time consuming. So a piece, um, a piece of furniture like this would, would be the cost of a small house, I presume? And then yeah. and today, yes. And today, of yeah. Course, yeah. So when somebody, so this was made for a very rich family. Um, again, it's like a status symbol. This would be in the entrance of their house, um, and inside they would, with all these little drawers, 
they would show their piece of silk and pieces which they've um, gathered from, from their travels and it would be standing on a uh, walnut base. Um, and this is what, 16, 17? Well, again, this is around the 1700s. Um, having the, 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 the floral marquetry, um, and you're seeing lots of flowers, so we're heavily influenced, again, by, by the Dutch. The Dutch uh, were over here, and, um, migrant workers, and it reflected, it was the fashion, you know, because we had on the throne, they said William and Mary, mm -hmm. King William, and he was heavily influenced by having his own Dutch style of furniture, and it was a thing to have. So we're just finishing off on this marquetry panel. Now, I'm going to show you this other panel here of showing the, the detail. And with fine marquetry work, this is what it's all about. It's all in the detail. It's like a picture, it's like a painting. It that. is, it is pictorial, it's beautiful. Now, if we take this part here, this is all hand cut, and then what he would, it's only men who did this, very few women are known to have made these things, but it's all hand cut. They would have cut this um, head of a flower, then they would have cut the inside out, and then that would have been laid inside. Now in places you'll see here, for example, uh, the shadowing. Now, how did they do that shadowing, we ask ourselves? Is that dyeing? No, there was no dyeing on, on this. This is all natural colours um, on this particular panel. What they did, they heated it in sand, in silver sand, and so it was slightly scorched. And when With you get this... Each little piece. Each right? little piece. So when you get this scorching effect here and here and here, you get this... Um, and when it's laid down, you get this shadowing, so the whole thing becomes alive. And um, that's, again, a true art in itself, knowing when to stop the scorching. If you go too far, the piece will actually just catch a light and burn. So a little piece, this little sliver here, this um, triangle piece here, will be laid in a piece of silver sand, which has been burning for an hour or so, left for a few minutes or a few seconds, then taken out, rested, then placed in there. So some of these cabinets could take many months or even years for them to be, to be built. So the groundwork is ebony and this work around is walnut. Um, now, I've hinted about uh, two woods um, sycamore. This is, this wood here, this is known as lacewood. Have you heard of lacewood? Never. Right. Lacewood is very, very common. Um, if you go around London, you'll see the big plane trees. That's what lacewood is. Oh. It's from the London plane tree. Oh, wow. And this other wood here, sort of this, satin wood look about it has a, it has a, uh, a satin wood colour to it, but it has um, little speckles running through, and um, so that, that's that's lacewood. When we look at sycamore as itself, it has these striations to it. Um, sycamore uh, is again, it's an interesting wood because say it dyes and holds colour particularly well. Um, it's often dyed uh, green or red, and to get a grey colour, it was soaked. They used to soak it in water, and there would be like a chemical reaction. So when you see um, pieces of, of uh, marquetry work, you know, now you can ask yourself, that's how they got these colours. And it holds very, very well. Um, it was quite fashionable at one stage, in the uh, 18th century to have um, large ornamental trees. And so we started having the, uh, the horse chestnut, sycamore, uh, popular as just ornamental trees. And the, 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 the sycamore, uh, which was then, well, later became known as the um, uh, filled maple, uh, 
some people will actually look at maple and think it's a weed because they do if you see a sycamore they, but they, 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 they suddenly can be everywhere because they're little um, uh, uh, seeds once the wind gets hold of them and they start blowing around the countryside they're, they're everywhere so sycamore some people love them some people hate them but as a cabinet maker they can be very useful you'll find in, in some of the larger houses uh, sycamore often used in the kitchens. If you go into a country house, you'll see the big farmhouse table, that the top of the table will possibly be an inch and a half, two inches thick, and that will be sycamore and be used in the dairy. Um, you'll find... Very um, hardwood, is it? It's very hard, very dense, and the reason why it's often used in, in kitchens and in, in, uh, and in the dairies, because it's as I say, because it stains, and if the housekeeper would see something's got spilt, it would lie there on the, on the surface, and so then they would get somebody else to come along and scrub that table to get it clean. Basically sand it off? More or less, yes, okay. yeah. So in the, in, the, in the kitchens of large houses, you'll see a lot of sycamore implements, bowls and things like that. This piece, um, is to me made by the, the master, uh, which is Thomas Chippendale. And um, so not made by him, it's from his workshop. Apparently, um, Thomas Chippendale only made approximately 700 pieces of furniture. Because we saw these pictures of, um, and items which are, quote, Chippendale, are not uh, of Chippendale's design. He made, he made books, though, didn't he, with, with his designs on them? He made a publication, and his publication made him lift at him. And so everybody, it was anybody, had his director. So that, that's, that's a clever move by him. But say, apparently he may, only made about 700 pieces of furniture. Can, they, can you tell? I've always, I've always wanted to know. I'm an auctioneer, so I've always wanted to know. <clears throat> they say it's Chippendale. I'm, like, over the moon to look at it, but... You, how do you tell if it was actually made by him, is it? You, you How can you tell? You can't. You, there's the most important thing, being an auctioneer, you would know is provenance. If you've got the provenance and someone's got some, something in writing, as I say, what can't speak can't lie. If it's in, written down, um, it helps. With um, some of Chippendale's things, I mean, he supplied his biggest contract was... Um, Harewood House and it, we, we've got documentary evidence from uh, the LaSalle's family that the furniture was supplied by Thomas Chippendale. There's documents saying he supplied. So the two things marry up so beyond all reasonable doubt you know what's in that house was made and supplied by him. This piece of furniture here, this box, um, has characteristics which follows Chippendale's, uh, which, which, which follows which was came out of Chippendale's workshop. The groundwork is Harewood. When we look back early, we could see these kind of striations. Mm, yeah, yeah. So we've got the Harewood. Um, you have this ebony border, which is so typical of pieces of this age. This we're talking about uh, 1765. This lovely big oval in the centre and then we have the floral marquetry work. It's amazing how they've, um, <clears throat> it's amazing how he's got the, the shadows and stuff doing the same technique that you said but in... There we got, if you look here that's where you've got this scorching. But it's only done on part of it. Though, it's it's all that. been done on most of them but it's knowing when to stop, and that's um, the sign of a good cabinet maker. It's detail. It, again, being this, this is um, it's, it's the lid of the box. It's going to be suffering from um, from the light, so the UVs. So it will it's faded, but it's still holding colour. Now, as I implied earlier, that people spent a lot of time in, in their house, and they wanted colour, and. When this was made, 
this is still, this is um, uh, tulip wood. So it's still holding the color pink. We've got the natural color of the sycamore. The little hair bells, you can see it's still holding the green. So would, it, would it be bright green? Bright green, <clears throat> bright green. The roses, they would have been red. Oh wow. The, um, you can see the foliage on, the, on, on your the side, that's still so holding green. Yeah. So we've got black, pink, reds, greens. Oh, wow. And so suddenly this box, it comes alive. When you look on the, the base here, we can see actually the sycamore green here. So it's the whole thing. It's singing, would have been singing. Absolutely. It's singing, it's singing now, yeah. but it would yeah. have been absolutely singing. Now. And when we look in the interior, this is what Chippendale wanted to bring into this country, was this redwood. Because people had been living with oak and walnut, and they would see this redwood, mahogany. People talk about brown wood. What was brown? <laughs> mm. Mahogany was bright red. When we look in the interior, we see the sycamore again. Look how bright yellow it is. The colours are amazing. And, um, you know, this is just a little small box, but to me, it's beautiful. It's a work of art. I mean, if you were to, just because obviously the viewer would obviously like to know what sort of monies would, if you <clears throat> wanted to buy, purchase something like that, obviously they're so rare, so I'm, t yeah. I'm sure it's... Um, you'd be happy, I'd be happy to find something like this. It would cost around uh, four to 5,000 pounds. Condition is everything. And when you look at this box, um, because it's come from, uh, let's say, a good stable, someone's always looked after it. But its condition is everything, and the condition on this is absolutely amazing. Wow. This is, um, again, it's got the influence of the William and Mary period, because when we look at the feet, they look, sort of, they look like little balls of Edam cheese, little spheres. The, the wood itself um, is Prince... Is it a secretaire bookcase or ab it's, ab it's, a, it's a full front bureau, um, escritaire. Um, it's English, possibly made by a migrant worker um, from Holland. And it follows, the, uh, say it's influenced by the um, Dutch. Now, when we look at the veneers, on this, again, all hand cut, we have Kingwood, and Kingwood is very popular in France. France, yeah. And then we have another wood, which is called Prince's Wood. Because we couldn't have another Kingwood, so we have Prince's Wood. Now we call Prince's Wood Rosewood. Oh, okay. When we look at this, we've got these lovely concentric circles, top and bottom, cross-banded on the ends, the circles are large oysters. And what it, if you look very carefully, you can see um, an oyster there, 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 and they all come together. And, when, and they, it's so finely made. When you look in the center, the little points are amazing. And the whole is just magnificent. Just so fascinating to know about it, because you just wouldn't <clears throat> You think it's beautiful, but when you look at the when you actually really go into what you're talking about now, the the workmanship that goes into it is just phenomenal, just to create that pattern yeah. there. Yeah, and this is only on the ends. So, I mean, as 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 a dealer, but I was was told that how do you judge a piece of furniture? Look at it in the most obscure angle. So, if the ends are good, the front's going to be even better, which everybody sees.